So in today's lecture, we're going to start talking about uh, reproduction, uh, nesting biology in, in birds. Now we've already talked about molting and migration, and these are two very energetically expensive uh, times in a bird's life. And the third kind of most Im energetically expensive um, uh, event in the annual cycle of a bird is reproduction. We've already talked about the the reproductive physiology and anatomy, um, but let's let and, and also we talk about mating systems. But once we've got the birds together, we've got them on the breeding ground. Um, what happens then? And that's what we're going to focus on now. Um, but just to again put this in perspective of how costly this is, uh, reproduction can increase the energy needs uh, of a bird by 50%. Um, and so what this, and that's due to things like courtship defense by males typically, uh, territory defense, um, and then just the courtship itself um, attracting, uh, trying to attract the female. From the female's perspective, egg production is both energetically and nutritionally expensive. Uh, and then for both of them again, because most birds uh, do show biparental care, parental care is extremely uh, energetically uh, and time costly. So because of the energetic expenditures associated with each of these uh, annual uh, events in the annual cycle, you don't see a lot of overlap between them. Birds just can't pull that off. So they have to um, subdivide each of these three uh, key events in different times of the year. And so here's a, a good example of this looking at the annual cycle of a, of a yellow warbler, a neotropical migrant here. Uh, we should have, I haven't seen one yet, but we should be having a yellow warblers here in East Texas now. All right, so let's look at the annual cycle of, of uh, a yellow warbler. So we have in um, January, February, March, that's when we're going to have the birds molting. And remember, this is when they're going to be down on the wintering ground, and they're going to be going through the pre-alternate molt to get the, to the alternate plumage. At that point, then you see migration. And this is, the, the darker this line, it shows you um, where the bulk of, of the migration is. Some individuals are leaving much earlier, some individuals are uh, leaving late. But once they do arrive, boom, they kick into reproduction. So they begin uh, uh, building their nest, laying eggs, and then eventually, for those that are successful, those eggs hatch and produce young. Now it looks like there's some overlap here between the migration that would happen in the fall or after the brooding season and the molt that would occur after um, reproduction. So this would be the pre-basic molt. But really an individual is not going to show this. This is looking at kind of the, the range of individuals in the population. And individuals that breed earlier and suc breed successfully, they're the ones that are going to molt uh, at this time period. Okay. Individuals that fail to breed early and kind of gets a late start because they were late in migration, or if their nest fails, they have to redo that, they're going to finish up later and they're also going to be molting later. And they're also going to be migrating later. And we're going to see that this, is, this has some important consequences on their future reproductive success and also their future survival. I also want to point out that uh, of these two molts, clearly the complete molt associated with the pre-basic molt is going to be more energetically expen expensive because you're molting not only uh, the body feathers, but you're uh, molting uh, the uh, remiges and rectrices, so the flight feathers. All right, let's look at the consequences if you, if you try to overlap these things. This is a really cool study on American Red Starts in which if individuals are, are good at making sure they don't overlap these uh, aspects of their life, they tend to uh, stay healthy and, and set themselves up for future reproductive success. So individuals that nest early, successfully, or because they have a nest failure, there could be predation, for example, and they don't nest again, they go. both of these groups of individuals would just go ahead and complete their molt um, and get fueled up 
for a, a nice uh, fall migration so that they're not over trying to overlap those things. Now the American red starts a little different as far as the um, uh, where it gets its bright feathers and what what time period. So this pre-basic molt that they would be going through after reproduction um, is actually when they do get these bright uh, um, feathers associated with the tail, the, the rectrices, and the remiges, uh, the wing feathers. So they're a little different in that regard. And that's going to be an important part of this story here. So this is these are achieved during the complete molt, which is not usually the, the typical uh, pattern. I mean, you, you're getting the pre-basic molt that really is pretty key to their um, reproductive success the following year. But these individuals that do this early, they get these nice uh, contrasting uh, black and orange uh, wing patterns. So let's look at the annual cycle of the American Red Star. So we've got the breeding season here. Okay, so the individuals that breed earlier, they complete their molt early, as you can see here. Okay, individuals that breed late because they arrived late on the breeding ground or they're re-nesting, um, they're going to be in these classes over here. These are also classes of, of molting going into the pre-basic molt. Some of them are considerably late, and some of these individuals literally are molting while they're migrating. And this puts such an energetic stress that they produce lighter colored feathers. So the black isn't as black, and you get more of a yellowy um, patches instead of these nice orange patches uh, here in the wings. Well, this has two important consequences. One, when they do arrive on the wintering grounds, there is territoriality associated with those uh, um, defensive territories for resources used during the wintering round. So they're going to, first of all, they're getting there late. The best territories have already taken, have been taken up, and we've already talked about the importance of arriving first, uh, resident advantage, with regard to being able to compete for those and, and keep those types of territories. But also they just don't look as, as dominant. And so they're going to be, there's another, that's another, um, uh, point against them with regard to getting a, a quality wintering territory. Okay, so let's say that you do get a wintering territory or if you have to kind of float and, and scramble for resources. You're not going to be as healthy and, and capable of storing up the fats that are required to make the migration back north to the breeding ground. So then the partial molt that they're going to go through um, at the uh, prior to spring migration might be a little later. They're going to migrate late, uh, later in spring migration because it's going to take them longer to accumulate the resources needed. So they're going to get on the breeding grounds later and get probably the leftover territories or maybe serve as floaters. And so the, it, it um, reduces their chance of, of breeding uh, the next year. And if they do breed they're likely to breed again later, which again is going to put them in the situation where they're trying to molt and migrate at the same time. So they get caught in this never-ending loop of, of handicapping themselves because they can't stay on track with schedule. All right, this is going to be a bit of a review. We've already talked about kind of some of the regulatory factors associated with uh, timing of, of uh, the breeding cycle. Remember, birds have their gonads uh, atrophied during much of the year, and um, photo period changes in temperate zone birds are typically what um, stimulate the production of hormones to get the, the reproductive cycle going again. So increased day length uh, triggers uh, pituitary ho the hormones, and this is stimulated by the pineal gland, the hypothalamus itself directly, and the retina uh, tracking the increase in, in daylight. Here's a really cool study that documented um, that this was a proximate mechanism associated with stimulating the reproductive cycle. Um, this was a, a study done, gosh, I think it says on here somewhere. Uh, where is it? 1927, I think. Um, so long, you know, almost uh, 100 years ago, researcher was looking at 
uh, the gonadal growth of the testes in males uh, in the wild population and showing that it, it really peaked late May, uh, early June and took some individuals into um, a laboratory setting and artificially increased day lengths for five to ten minutes a day at different times of the year to show that you could also stimulate the growth of the testes at different times of the year. So midwinter having it peak in January, um, but it could also uh, recreate basically what's going on um, in uh, nature in environmental uh, artificial circumstances as well if you tracked the typical photo period uh, pattern. So a very elegant uh, demonstration of what's going on here. So for most temperate zone birds, that's the most important proximate factor daylink changes. But uh, temperature changes will uh, play a role also in the development of gonads in things like American robins. They'll track uh, snow melt um, as they gradually migrate uh, uh, following the, the snow melt patterns. In other habitats, uh, other factors may be uh, important as well. So in desert species, like uh, the gambles quails out in uh, the western US, zebra finches in Australia, um, rainfall can, uh, rainfall is relatively unpredictable uh, and so when it does occur it is such a rare event that it typically leads to a flush of, of food resources shortly thereafter and so that it triggers the birds to, to uh, uh, go into reproductive mode to take advantage of those uh, uh, time periods. In tropical species, uh, in some cases it's the end of the dry season or the end of the, the wet season, the rainy season that, that we see the peak of reproduction in those species depending on what um, food resources they're going after so that they're again timing their reproduction so that there's a, a peak of, of food availability. Um, hummingbirds and kingfishers in the uh, uh, New World tropics uh, tend to uh, breed at the peak of the dry season. And think about that, particularly in garbage with kingfishers. If water bodies are smaller, it concentrates the fish into denser aggregation, so it makes um, foraging for those uh, food sources a lot easier. Uh, and so getting food for yourself and also for your growing young is going to be a lot easier in the dry season. Here's a really kind of bizarre one. Um, Pinion jays and uh, crossbills are so um, co-evolved with the pine forest in which they grow in that um, the conifer growth patterns themselves can trigger uh, uh, the breeding cycles to begin in these species. This was discovered in pinion jays by uh, keeping them in, in artificial settings that were consistent with the time of year that they would breed, um, but that you couldn't really stimulate uh, uh, gonadal growth unless you put uh, green pine cones uh, in the, their um, cages with them. Alright, so those are the proximate mechanisms of, of uh, what triggers birds to breed when they do. But let's talk about the adaptive nature of this. What are the ultimate factors associated with this? I mean, why do they breed when they do? Well, climate um, can affect your reproductive success. Uh, warmer temperatures and uh, rainfall patterns can affect uh, incubation, so um, you have to keep those eggs warm. And if you have to get off of the nest, uh, be incubating in warmer climate it, it is going to make that a little easier so those eggs won't cool off too quickly. And rainfall patterns can definitely uh, affect nestling provisioning rates. When it's raining, um, insects are not moving as much. It can be harder to, to find those uh, food sources. And the birds don't like to get out uh, in the rain to forage. We've documented this with red cockaded woodpeckers. And in um, years in which there is a substantially more rainfall, we tend to see more nest failure and more brood reduction, um, fewer fewer young surviving in years where it's really rainy because the the uh, the birds are taking care of the young are just not as active. Another reason why birds breed where they do is maybe to escape pred uh, predation. So uh, the bird on the bottom left here we've seen in lab several times this is the brown-headed nuthatch. Remember the one that sounds kind of like the squeaky duck. Uh, 
or the bath toy uh, way up in the top of the pine trees. They're breeding right now, and they actually start breeding in uh, late February uh, here in East Texas. And one potential reason for that is uh, they can get a jump on reproduction uh, because the biggest thing that we've documented for their uh, lower reproductive success is uh, nest predation, uh, particularly by things like rat snakes. So if they can get out when it's still relatively cold out and the snakes are not moving as much, they have a, a better shot of, of reproducing. Um, and now one of the reasons that they can do that, because I already talked about how temperature could also be a, a factor you want to breed when it's warmer, these are cavity nesters. Cavity nesters can get away with breeding in cooler weather because the cavity itself is a better insulating uh, structure um, and um, um, so it allows them to, to breed uh, when, it's, when it's cooler. But for most birds, the factor that is most important in establishing when they breed uh, to determine what is the most adaptive timing for, for breeding is uh, food availability. So they want to breed so that they lay their eggs so that they hatch when the young are at their fastest growth pattern and need the most food they want to time that to the peak of availability of uh, the food that the young will be eating. And in many passerine birds this is going to be associated with peak of, of insect abundance uh, like this uh, chickadee here. Now non-migrants can spread out the reproductive season. Um, they tend to have more clutches per uh, season. So northern cardinals here can have up to four clutches per year. They can get away with that because they don't have to store up energy um, for migration. So the three things that we talked about, the energetic expenditures in the annual cycle of migratory birds is migration, molt, and reproduction. Well, if you take migration out of that, it, it uh, expands the time period in which birds, uh, resident birds, can molt and reproduce, and so they take advantage of that uh, increased window of opportunity. Now, some birds uh, don't really follow an annual cycle. So some of the seabirds nesting in these large colonies, uh, particularly in tropical areas, um, can have uh, eight to 10 month cycles. Um, because their food is, is consistent enough and they can get enough food and resources um, to um, breed more often. On the other hand, some of the really large birds, um, reproduction is so costly to them that if they try to reproduce too often, it actually could decrease their chances of survival into the next reproductive opportunity and decrease their lifetime reproductive success. And this is a, we'll talk a li little bit more about this later in the semester, life history strategies. When to breed, um, how long you live, and oftentimes those things uh, are counter to each other. So if you breed too much, you're, you're, uh, you may not live as long. Um, and the goal for all organisms is to pass on as many copies of genes as possible. So for some of these large birds that have the potential to live for many, many years, you don't over, want to overdo it in any single year because it could reduce your chances of survival if you put yourself in bad physiological uh, state. So some of the large gulls can live for many, many decades um, if, if they uh, time things correctly. Some species, uh, their breeding season will vary across their range if they have a broad geographic range. So um, here we see brown pelicans. You see that in parts of the tropics where hurricanes are not really an issue uh, farther south, um, you can see them breeding pretty much year round. Um, the darker the line indicates there's a con relative concentration there, but if there's a line going across there, it says that reproduction has been seen in those time periods. You don't see that as you go north here, though. Um, these are the areas where you're more likely to get some uh, severe uh, hurricanes, and uh, you're going the, the birds uh, avoid breeding during hurricane season. And the f really, if you go way far north, they're not going to breed in uh, the, the winter uh, months as well. 
All right, well, let's talk about building the nest itself. Um, not all birds really build nests. So we've talked about uh, birds like uh, these uh, mirrors, and they simply just lay their eggs on a rocky cliff. And we talked about the importance of having this piriformis uh, triangular shaped egg to keep it from rolling off. Um, other birds like this tern can just lay their egg directly on a branch. So some birds, there really is no nesting structure. But most birds do produce some nest, as minimal as it is, and the, the most minimal modification of an area to contain a nest is what we call a scrape. And it literally is just scraping out a place on the ground uh, to, to put your eggs. It may minimize them from rolling around. So we see that with this plover and with his nightjar. Once you start adding um, structures to form a, a structural nest, the simplest is a platform. And that's seen in uh, doves, herons. Uh, so a heronry will, will have these big bulky uh, platform nests. Sometimes they're actually large enough and they can actually float uh, to put them out in a, a water body to, to allow them to escape predation. Um, dove nests, if you've seen a dove nest, like a morning dove nest, they are just minimal. Uh, th they only lay two eggs at a time and their reproductive strategy is to just breed multiple times and so they don't spend a lot of time on each individual nest or each individual reproductive uh, attempt. There's a little selection pressure to, to, to make a very uh, architecturally sound uh, structure. But most of the birds that you're familiar with put a little bit more time and, and more architectural finesse uh, into the creation of a, of a nest that is more of a cup-like structure. The platform nests are pretty much just kind of just flat, maybe have a slight indention. Uh, but a cup nest it produces this um, nice sunken area for the egg to house the eggs. Um, they can be woven, uh, made out of uh, vegetation material and hair in many cases or in some cases made out of um, uh, mud. We're going to talk about different types of cups, nests, and how they sit on the, the structure that, that supports them. If it's simply sitting on top of something, if it's resting on top of something, we call that a statent cup nest. Here's another example of a statent cup nest associated with hummingbirds. And a lot of birds at this point do a lot to make sure that their nest is camouflaged. Um, so hummingbirds oftentimes will take spider webs to um, attach lichens uh, onto their nest to make them uh, blend in with the environment. They'll also take soft uh, and very nice uh, thermally insulating materials like hair and fine uh, uh, plant fibers to give those nests uh, more insulating capabilities as well and we're going to see that that's an important aspect of nest is making sure that they're very well insulated. If you take a cup nest and instead of it being a state nest sitting on top of something if it hangs we have two different types of cup nests that hang. If it's a relatively short nest basically just like like the cups we saw previously this is what we call a pensile cup nest. And this would be associated with a nest like an orchard oriole, shown on the left, or a, a red-eyed vireo, which, which are arriving here in East Texas. Now you take a pensile nest and you stretch it out to make this long purse, then you have a pendulous cup nest. And that is typical of orioles and oropendulas. Let me back up a minute. Now there's there's a huge advantage of the pendulous and uh, pensile cup nests. They can be attached to relatively small branches and just hang there. This puts them farther away from um, predators that might be trying to crawl out on a limb to uh, get at the eggs or the nestlings. And so it provides some extra protection against predators. Uh, by being able to put them out on teeny tiny little limbs, 
that wouldn't be big enough to support a statent uh, cup nest. Some birds have uh, the ability to take their cup nest and glue it onto the side of something. So um, a lot of swallows uh, will um, take the mud that they gather and glue it to the uh, side of, of a cliff or the underside of a um, culvert um, uh, of a bridge going over uh, associated with a highway. So that's an adherent cup nest. Some birds produce a domed-like structure, so these are domes, and they can produce that uh, either out of a mud-like material, like these um, oven birds in South America. It's different from our oven bird here. This is this is our oven bird here in, in North America, which is actually a warbler, remember. It also produces a uh, um, domed nest, but this is uh, produced out of a vegetation similar to what the um, cactus wren will do in the desert southwest of the U.S. Now some dome nests have um, a large chamber that has a smaller what we call a retort opening and this this reduces the size of the entrance to in an attempt to limit uh, who can go into that nest and it, it may prevent um, predators from gaining access uh, some provide some protection so here we have some cliff swallows and we have this social uh, weaver um, on the right. Now here's one of my favorite examples of, of an adaptation to reduce predation associated with a nest. This is the nest of a, a southern penduline tit. The arrow here is indicating what looks to clearly be an entrance to a nest. But that is actually not where the birds nest. The birds actually nest in this area right here. This little retort above that, you can see this bird coming out of it, that leads to a chamber down here below this fake chamber. Um, so the idea is a predator will go into this fake chamber or reach its hand in, or beak into that fake chamber, say, ah, nothing here, move on. Uh, but they really actually missed uh, the treasure that they were looking for regarding finding eggs or nestlings. The Rufus Hornero, um, a, another group in the ovenbird uh, clade of South America, um, produce these really extravagant, um, they're, they're called the ovenbirds because they have these clay-like oven uh, nesting st uh, structures, these domed structures, and they also produce, instead of a retort, a, a kind of vestibule with this curvature that would also limit the ability of an animal like a Quarimundi or a raccoon or, or some predator to reach its, its hand or a, a, another bird to reach its bill into this area and get at the nestlings. All right, well, let's talk about cavity nesting birds. Uh, I've already mentioned the advantage that the thermal advantages that cavity nests uh, can provide to something like a brown headed nuthatch. Um, but let's talk about cavities in regard to how they're actually created. If you can actually build your own cavity, you're what is called a primary cavity nester. So our woodpeckers are the prime, the, the main primary cavity nesters in North America that you're familiar with. But the brown-headed nuthatch I mentioned, it does also excavate its own cavity. So that's, that's what defines a primary cavity nester. They excavate their cavity. And typically this is in uh, dead trees or dead portions of trees like this red headed woodpecker, the pileated woodpecker here, but they can also use uh, other structures like cactus, like the Gila woodpecker that you'd see in, uh, say, the Tucson area of the Sonoran Desert. Um, and this is our local red cockaded woodpecker. Notice it's got this whitish material around the nesting cavity here. That is uh, crystallized resin. They create these resin wells uh, above and below and all around the cavity entrance to make it sticky and uh, the resin has chemicals in it that would be irritant, an irritant to something like a snake that would be trying to get to the nest. Well, that's only going to work if you're, if you're excavating in a live tree. And so these woodpeckers excavate these cavities 
and, and lot, very large. They have a preference for old growth or very old, very large uh, uh, diameter uh, living pine trees. They prefer um, longleaf pines because of the, the, the rate of resin flow and the chemical constituents associated with that resin flow, we believe. Um, but it's pretty easy to excavate a cavity in a dead tree. It's not easy to do so in a live tree. And so the average time period it takes a red carcated woodpecker to do this is four and a half years. So these are very valuable resources that are used year after year and actually transferred uh, generation to generation among family members. So if you can't make your own cavity, then you're what is called a secondary cavity nester. So um, this could in, include something like uh, wood ducks, uh, these beautiful prothonotary warblers that we're going to be seeing uh, here in East Texas. Oh, I'm sure they're here now. Uh, if you go back down, if, you, if you're in the area and you go down to the tram road, you go to an area with lots of water, um, you'll just see these beautiful, um, um, almost candles uh, sticking out in the, the trees, uh, in the brush, in a swampy area. Those are the prothonotary warblers. Only, they're the only one of two species, they're one of two species of warblers in North America that are cavity nesters. Uh, it's the only eastern one that is a cavity nester. But the, the, what distinguishes a secondary cavity nester from a primary cavity nester is primary cavity nesters can make their own cavities. Secondary cavity nesters have to use and abandon nests made by a primary cavity nester or use a natural cavity formed uh, in some structure. So, you can imagine that primary cavity nesters, in some cases, provide an important resource for secondary cavity nesters and can be an important um, um, factor in um, making sure that those, those species can exist in, in uh, the, those environments. So here was a study looking at northern flickers um, in British Columbia up in Canada. And it's clear that northern the presence of northern flickers really makes them a keystone species. A keystone species is one in which if you remove that species, um, it has drastic impacts on the, the rest of the community. So if we look at um, the primary cavity nesters and the trees that they're using in this uh, one habitat, you see that um, the northern flicker um, is um, a, a very important uh, species that, that utilizes a variety of species of trees, but it's really using a lot of aspen um, and other species are using uh, aspen as well. So aspen is clearly the most important uh, tree in, in this uh, ecological community. But the reason I said the northern flicker is the most important is look at how many lines associated with going from the northern flicker are extending to other species of secondary cavity nesting birds and even uh, mammals, uh, other uh, birds. So if you took those out, sure, there are some other woodpeckers and some natural cavities that could be formed to, to provide um, secondary cavities for these sec secondary cavity nesters. But boy, if you take out the northern flickers, uh, you're taking out a lot of that availability. Another uh, secondary cavity nester that has a really interesting story are the hornbills. Um, hornbills, um, the females, uh, hornbills will actually uh, seal themselves into a secondary cavity that they are, are going to breed in. After mating, they will lay their eggs and incubate um, while the nestlings are developing she actually will seal herself in with mud and excrement um, to, to make it where other predators can't get into that nest. And she stays in there to take care of the young during incubation. Now the problem with that is she can't get out. And so she's totally reliant on the male to deliver um, uh, food to her. 
and you can see that this is the area that's been sealed in so she can't get out she's totally relying on the male to bring food for both her and for the nestlings and they have a relatively long uh, protracted um, developmental uh, season so it could be weeks that the female is in here and there are cases in which the female has sealed herself in if something happens to her mate uh, if he dies uh, she literally can't get out uh, she can't get out of that cavity until um, uh, it has kind of dried up and become weakened so that she can chip herself out. Um, they do such a good job of sealing themselves in, cementing themselves in, that uh, she could die uh, in that uh, cavity uh, if the male dies as well. If you have a cavity that is produced in some, some of these uh, categories I'm giving you are kind of artificially specific. If you have a cavity that is produced in into the ground, you, we typically call that a burrow. Um, it is also basically a primary cavity. Sometimes they're actually produced in uh, termitaria, so termite mounds. Uh, birds will excavate cavities in those, and that's what's shown here in the upper right. Is Kingfisher doing that? If you build a basically a mound of vegetation and then excavate a cavity associated with that, then uh, you are uh, also basically producing kind of a, a burrow slash a cavity uh, type uh, structure. Um, this is seen in the hammercop of Africa. Uh, monk parakeets will do this. You can see them in uh, Houston and Austin uh, building these big mounds uh, in light poles. Bottom left here, this is a, a mound uh, structure associated with social weavers in which they uh, produce these these massive, uh, basically apartment complexes where there would be lots and lots of individual cavities um, in these, these mounds. And there are a lot of thermal benefits for this type of, of cavity. But the mounds that you're probably most familiar with or have heard about are from the mound builders. And this is a very different type where you're not actually producing a cavity with an entrance that you can go in and out. Uh, the mound builders uh, are in the, 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 the called the megapodes uh, is the family uh, megapodidae and uh, males and females mate the female will lay eggs onto the ground and then the male will cover those eggs up completely with um, soil sand oftentimes um, and mix in with that vegetation material that he will take care of that mound uh, during the developmental period by simply probing his bill and his tongue into um, the, the structure to get a sense of what the temperature is. And we'll remove uh, vegetation if it gets too hot, uh, add vegetation if it's getting too, uh, too cold. Uh, sometimes they'll do this in volcanic soils and so they can maintain the temperature by uh, moving just sand in these volcanic uh, soils. Um, but the eggs are completely covered uh, during this period, and when the, the young hatch, they actually dig themselves out of these nests. Uh, and at that point, the male is already abandoned. Um, so if, when the young actually hatch at that stage of development, they come out um, looking like adults. This is an example of what we call a super precocious uh, uh, forms of development. So here's a kind of a cutaway looking at uh, one of these nests. So the, the heat is uh, coming from the sun or the uh, rotting vegetation or again volcanic heat. Um, so this is the only species in which the eggs don't have to be incubated uh, by an individual. The incubation temperature is actually produced by uh, these sources. And again, the male is the one that tends to this and the chicks uh, develop in here for a very long time period so that when they hatch, they're pretty much good to go, which is super precocial. Okay, so that's the first kind of half of uh, looking at nesting biology in birds. Uh, and I'll pick up 
the, the rest of the material in the next lecture.